Professor Chomsky, a first question comes from John Berger. Political practice often surprises political vocabulary. For example, the recent revolution in the Middle East is said to demand democracy. Can we find more adequate words? Isn't the use of the old and frequently betrayed words a way of absorbing this shock instead of welcoming it and transmitting it further? Well, I, just to begin, I think the word revolution is a bit of an exaggeration. Maybe it'll turn into a revolution, but uh, for the moment it's uh, a call for moderate reform. Uh, short, uh, there are elements in it, like the workers' movement, that are trying to move beyond that, but that remains to be seen. However, his point is correct, but there's no way out of that. It's not just the word democracy, it's every word that uh, uh, is involved in discussion of uh, political affairs uh, has uh, two meanings, has its literal meaning, has a meaning that's assigned to it uh, for political warfare, for ideology, for doctrine. Uh, so either we stop talking or we try to use the words in a sensible way. And it's not just democracy, it's, uh, I mean, take the word, a simple word like person, sounds simple. Take a look at it. Uh, the, in the United States, it's quite interesting. The, the United States has uh, guarantees of personal rights that go beyond maybe any other country. But have a look at them. The, uh, const the amendments to the Constitution uh, state very explicitly that no person can be deprived of rights, this is the rights, without due process of law. Well, that was, uh, it, it reappears in the 14th Amendment, it was in the 5th Amendment, and it uh, was intended to apply to uh, freed slaves, but it had never been, it's never been applied to them. Uh, the courts narrowed the meaning and broadened the meaning, crucially. Uh, they broadened the meaning to include uh, corporations. Uh, fictitious legal entities established by state power. Uh, so they were given the rights of persons, by now rights way beyond persons. Uh, on the other hand, it was also narrowed because uh, the term persons, you might think, uh, would apply to those uh, creatures walking around who do the dirty work in the society uh, but don't happen to have uh, documents. And that wouldn't do because they must be deprived of rights. So the courts, in their wisdom, decided they're not persons. Uh, the only persons are people with uh, citizenship. Uh, so now uh, non-humans, uh, corporate entities, uh, like the Barclays Bank meeting next door, they're persons with rights way beyond persons, humans. And uh, the people you know, sweeping the streets uh, are not persons, they don't have rights. Uh, and the same is true at just about every term you look at. Uh, so take, say, uh, free trade agreements. For example, there's a North American free trade agreement, uh, Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Uh, the only accurate term in that is North American. Uh, it's certainly not an agreement, at least if human beings are part of their societies, because the population in all three countries was against it. So it's not an agreement. Uh, it's not about free trade. Uh, in fact, it has, it's highly protectionist. You know, tremendous protections for uh, uh, monopoly pricing rights for uh, pharmaceutical corporations and so on. A lot of it isn't about trade at all. Uh, in fact, what we call trade is a, a kind of a joke. So for example, in the old Soviet Union, if uh, uh, parts were uh, manufactured, say, in Leningrad, and shipped to uh, Warsaw for assembly, and then sold in Moscow. And we didn't call that trade, although it did cross national borders. It was interactions within a single command economy. And exactly the same is true if uh, General Motors manufactures uh, parts in Indiana, uh, sends them to Mexico for assembly, and sells them in Los Angeles. But we call that trade both ways. In fact, if you look at the trade, it's about 50% of it, not small. Uh, and a lot of the agreement is just about investor rights, uh, say granting uh, uh, General Motors uh, the rights of national companies in Mexico, for example, which Mexicans, of course, don't get in the United States. And you pick the term you want. Uh, 
you're going to find exactly the same thing. So yes, that's a problem, and we get around it by uh, trying to be clear about uh, the way we use our own terminology. Second questions come from award-winning journalist Chris Hedges. Julian Benda, in The Treason of Intellectuals, argued that it is only when intellectuals are not in the pursuit of practical aims, of material advantages, that they can serve as a conscience and as a corrective. Can you address the loss of philosophers, religious leaders, writers, journalists, artists, and scholars whose lives were once lived in direct opposition to the realism of the multitudes and what this has meant for our intellectual and moral life? Well, the only, uh, I mean, I understand his feelings and share them, but I don't know what the loss was. When was it ever true? Uh, and at no time that I can remember. Um, the term intellectual came into pretty common usage in the modern sense at the time of the Dreyfusards. They were a small minority, a small uh, vilified minority. Uh, the mass of intellectuals supported state power. Uh, during the First World War, shortly afterwards, uh, the intellectuals of every one of the countries uh, passionately supported their own state and its own violence. Now, there were a handful of exceptions, like Bertrand Russell in England, or uh, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht in Germany, or uh, uh, Eugene Debs in the United States. They were all in jail. They were a margin, and they were imprisoned. Yeah, so yes, they were there. Uh, in the John Dewey circle, the liberal intellectuals in the United States, passionately pro-war. There was one member, Randolph Bourne, who didn't go along with it. He wasn't put in jail. The United States is a pretty free country. Uh, but he was thrown out of the journals, you know, intellectually exiled and so on. That's the way it's always been. Uh, during the, uh, say, 1960s, big activist period, you take a careful look. Uh, intellectuals were very supportive of Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement as long as he was attacking somebody else. As long as the Civil Rights Movement was going after racist sheriffs in Alabama, that was wonderful. You know, everybody praised it, you know, uh, we talk big high rhetoric and so on. As soon as he turned to class issues uh, and uh, uh, he was marginalized and suppressed. Uh, people tend to forget that he was killed when he was uh, uh, taking part in a, a sanitation worker strike and on his way to Washington to help organize a poor people's movement. Well, that crosses the boundary. That goes after us. That goes after privilege in the North and so on. So the intellectuals disappeared. Uh, with regard to the Vietnam War, it was exactly the same thing. There was almost no, among known, you know, there was, of course, people on the fringes. There were young people and so on. But among... Uh, you know, well-known intellectuals, uh, practically nothing. Uh, at the very end, after, uh, after the Tet Offensive in 1968, when the business community turned against the war, then you started getting a drifting of people saying, yes, I was always a, a long-time anti-war activist, no trace of it or whatever. But that's, uh, in fact, you can take this back um, to the earliest history. You go back to classical Greece. Who drank the hemlock? Uh, a guy who was accused of corrupting the youth of Athens with false gods. Uh, take uh, the biblical records. They didn't have the term intellectual, but they had a term which meant what we mean by intellectual. It's called prophet. It's a bad translation of an obscure Hebrew word. Well, there were uh, so-called prophets, intellectuals, who carried out a geopolitical critique, uh, you know, condemned the king for bringing about disaster, uh, condemned the king's crimes, called for uh, mercy for widows and orphans, and so on. What we would call dissident intellectuals. How are they treated? Uh, they were denounced as haters of Israel. It's the exact phrase that was used. It's the origins of the phrase uh, self-hating Jew in the modern period. Uh, they were imprisoned, uh, driven into the desert, and so on. Uh, there were intellectuals who were praised, uh, the flatterers at the court. Uh, centuries later, 
they were called false prophets, but not at the time. And that's almost the entire history since. There are few exceptions. In the modern period, the one major exception I know is actually Turkey. It's the only country I know where uh, leading prominent uh, uh, artists, uh, academics, journalists, uh, uh, publishers, a uh, very broad range of intellectuals, and not only condemn the crimes of the state, but are involved in constant civil disobedience against them, uh, facing, often enduring, pretty severe punishment. Uh, I have to laugh when I come to Europe and hear people complaining about how the Turks aren't civilized enough to join our advanced society. We could learn some lessons from Turkey, uh, but that's pretty unusual. In fact, it's so unusual that it can, it's barely known, you, know, you can't bring it up. But uh, aside from the word loss, I think Chris Hedges' comments are accurate, but I just can't perceive any loss. I think it's about the same as it's always been. And in fact, the way dissident intellectuals are treated, of course, does vary. So um, in the United States, let's say, maybe they're vilified or something. Uh, in um, the old Soviet Union, say in Czechoslovakia in uh, the 1960s and 70s, uh, they could be in prison, like uh, Havel was in prison. If you were in American domains at that time, like El Salvador, you get your brains, brains blown out by an elite battalion trained in the, the U.S. Special Warfare School. So yes, people are treated differently, depending on the country. Third question comes from um, um, Israeli journalist Amir Ahas. Have the uprisings in the Arab states made you change, revise some of the past evaluations? Have they and how affected your notions of, for example, masses, hope, Facebook, Western intervention, or surprise? Well, actually, uh, Amir and I met in Turkey a couple of months ago had a couple of hours, a chance to talk, and uh, neither of us, and maybe she did, if she did it was a secret, I certainly didn't anticipate anything that was gonna happen in the Arab world. So yes, it changed my opinion in that respect. It was unexpected. Uh, on the other hand, when you look back at it, it's not that different from what's happened before, except that in the past, uh, the uprisings were brutally suppressed, and indeed they were this time too. So the first of the uprisings was actually in November. Uh, that was in the Western Sahara, uh, which is uh, occupied by Morocco. 25 years ago, Morocco invaded. Uh, uh, it's violated UN resolutions. It's a brutal occupation. Uh, the, uh, in November, there was a nonviolent protest, which uh, Moroccan troops came in and crushed violently, as they've been doing for 25 years. Uh, it, it was serious enough so that it was brought to the UN for a, a potential inquiry, but France intervened. France is the primary protector of atrocities and crimes in Western Africa. It's the old French possessions. So they blocked any uh, UN inquiry. That was the first. Uh, the next one was in Tunisia, again, more or less French area. And you know, there were scandals, as you know. The, I think the Minister of Tourism or one of the ministers went for a vacation right in the middle of the uprising and uh, got some bad publicity. But uh, that one was successful. It threw out the uh, dictator. Then came Egypt, which is the most important because of its significance in, in the Arab world. And that was pretty remarkable. It was a remarkable uh, display of uh, the courage, uh, dedication, uh, commitment. Uh, it did succeed in getting rid of the dictator. It didn't, hasn't yet changed the regime, maybe it will, but the regime is pretty much in place, different names. Uh, the, uh, but it's nothing new. That uprising, the January 25th uprising, it was led by young people who call themselves the April 6th movement. Well, April 6th has a, for a reason. April 6th, they picked the name because it was the date of a major strike action a couple of years earlier uh, at the Mahala textile complex, big industrial complex. It was supposed to be a major strike, uh, uh, support activities and so on. Well, they were crushed by violence. That's April 6th, and that's only one of a series. Uh, 
Incidentally, shortly after the crushing of the April 6th uprising, uh, President Obama came to Egypt to deliver his famous address, uh, you know, outreach to the Muslim world and so on. Uh, on his way, he was asked at a press conference whether he would say anything about the uh, authoritarian uh, government of uh, President Mubarak. And he said, no, he wouldn't. He said, Mubarak's a good man. He's doing good things. He's keeping stability, like crushing the uh, April 6th strike and so on. So that's just fine. Uh, then the uprisings went beyond. Uh, the most uh, striking one is Bahrain. Uh, that's frightening to the West. First of all, because Bahrain uh, hosts the uh, Fifth Fleet, the major military force in the region, U.S. fleet. The second, because it's, it's largely Shia, and it's right across a causeway from uh, eastern Saudi Arabia, which is majority Shiite, and happens to be where all the, most of the oil is. Now that gets frightening. For years, Western planners have been concerned about a kind of a geographical and historical accident. Uh, most of the world's oil is in Shiite areas, right around that part of the Gulf, uh, uh, Iran, southern Iraq, and uh, eastern Saudi Arabia. Well, if the uprising in Bahrain spreads to Saudi Arabia, then Western power is really in trouble. Uh, and in fact, Obama has changed the rhetoric of, uh, that's used officially for the talk about the uprisings. For a while, it was uh, regime change. Uh, incidentally, that's after the uprising succeeded. Then you kind of move in and say, oh, it's fine. Uh, now it's regime alteration. We don't want any change. It's too valuable to have our dictators run things. Actually, a rather striking fact about all of this is uh, that uh, you take a look at the WikiLeaks exposures. It's pretty interesting. They, the, the, the ones that got the most uh, exposure in the West, the big headlines, a euphoric commentary, were uh, the leaks from the ambassadors which said that uh, the Arab world supports us against Iran. Well, uh, one thing was missing in that reaction in the newspapers by the columnists and others, uh, namely uh, Arab opinion. What they meant was the Arab dictators support us. Now, what about Arab opinion? It's known, but it's not reported. In the United States, zero. Uh, there's, I think, one report in England. Jonathan Steele reported it, probably nothing in France. I don't know. But it's, it's well known. Western uh, US polling agencies, uh, released by very prestigious agencies. It turns out that uh, uh, some Arabs uh, think, or think Iran is a threat, about 10%. Uh, a majority, uh, a vast majority, think the major threat is the United States and Israel. In Egypt, 90% say the United States is the major threat. Uh, in fact, opposition to U.S. policy is so strong that uh, in Egypt, I think it's close to 80%, think the region would be better off if Iran had nuclear weapons. Uh, over the whole region, it's a majority. Well, who cares? You know, our con going back to John Berger's term, democracy, Western intellectual contempt for democracy is so profound and deep-seated that it doesn't even occur to anyone to ask, well, what do Arabs think? when we are euphoric that the Arabs support us? Well, the answer is it doesn't matter. As long as they're quiet and subdued and controlled, as long as there's what's called stability, it doesn't matter what they think. The dictators support us, period. We're euphoric. Well, okay, that kind of ties together a number of these questions, but going back to Amir Haas's comments, you know, the, it, uh, what's happened uh, 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 does should lead us to think about what has been happening, uh, not only in the Arab world but elsewhere, uh, has uh, often arisen uh, and uh, has been subdued by violence. And that's been true for a century. I mean, the, Britain, the British were uh, suppressing uh, democracy movements in Iran uh, over a century ago. Uh, in Iraq, uh, uh, there was a Shiite uprising in uh, as soon as the British cobbled the country together after the First World War, 
big uprising, violently suppressed. Uh, one of the first uses, uses of uh, aircraft to uh, attack civilians. In fact, Britain was very proud of that. Uh, the famous Lloyd George, Britain succeeded in uh, blocking a disarmament conference in 1932. Uh, they prevented it from barring uh, use of aircraft against civilians. Uh, Lloyd George, famous Lloyd George, wrote in his diary that this was a great thing because uh, we have to reserve the right to bomb niggers. Uh, so therefore, it was a very good thing that the British government did. And uh, it continued. In 1953, uh, the United States and Britain combined to throw out the parliamentary government in, uh, in, uh, in Iran. Uh, in 1936 to 39, there was an Arab uprising in Palestine against the British, violently crushed. Uh, the first intifada was again a very significant popular uprising, almost entirely nonviolent, and a real popular movement. Uh, women's groups uh, attack, you know, uh, uh, protest against the feudal structure, try to dismantle it, and so on. It was crushed by violence. So sure, these things like this happen all the time. They're just crushed. What's unusual this time is that strong enough so it was in most of the countries able, uh, able to sustain itself. Uh, what will happen in, in Saudi Arabia and um, Bahrain, uh, Jordan, we don't know. Um, in fact, we really don't know what will happen in Egypt. Uh, the military has so far retained control, and the top military command, at least, is deeply embedded into the old uh, oppressive regime. They own a lot of the economy. And, uh, they were the beneficiaries of the Mubarak dictatorship. They're not going to give it up easily. So it remains to be seen what happens there. Next question is from uh, Ken Loach, award-winning filmmaker. How do we overcome sectarianism on the left? I don't think we'll ever overcome it. Uh, for one thing, one form of sectarianism should be welcomed, namely disagreement. There are a lot of a lot of things that are quite unclear. We ought to have uh, discussion, disagreement, uh, pursue different options, and so on. But what he means by sectarianism, and what is generally meant by it, is uh, uh, initiatives that uh, sometimes attempt to and often succeed in breaking up popular movements. Uh, so individuals or uh, political groups that have their own agenda and want to take control, you know, become little Lenins and so on and so forth. Uh, that kind of sectarianism I don't think is ever going to uh, really be suppressed. It can be marginalized. Uh, so, for example, during the, uh, during the uprisings in the Arab world, say Egypt, Tahrir Square, uh, it was surprisingly little sectarianism. And there were many different points of view, you know, uh, but there was a unity in uh, a common goal. And it's beginning to fall apart, unfortunately. So just uh, yesterday, uh, there was a women's uh, demonstration calling for women's rights. It was attacked uh, by, it's a very uh, sexist society, and the women were attacked and driven out. Okay, that's sectarianism. Uh, there's now also religious sectarianism developing. I mean, when a common goal is no longer sort of uniting people in a struggle, then you do get sectarianism. And uh, uh, that's the way to bring people together. Uh, so for example, in, in the labor movement, uh, the American, say in the United States, same elsewhere, but in the United States, the, uh, the labor has often been extremely racist. They did not necessarily just against blacks. Uh, for example, Irish in the late 19th century were uh, treated very much like uh, blacks. I mean, you could walk around Boston and see signs saying uh, no dogs or Irish allowed and so on. Uh, what were called Huns, that meant anybody from Eastern Europe. Uh, bitter racism against the Huns, against the Italians, you know, it goes all the way back. Uh, but when the strike waves began in the late 19th century, uh, and they really became significant in places like uh, uh, the coal and steel centers in western Pennsylvania, working for people, uh, took over cities and ran them. You know, at that point, the sectarianism disappeared, the racism disappeared. You know, there was unity uh, to achieve something, and the same was true in CIO organizing in the 1930s. Uh, 
it overcame you know, black, uh, racism against blacks. They worked together. And that's the only way to do it that I know. Same happened in the civil rights movement. Uh, if you've got a common goal, then you can combine in trying to achieve it. Uh, then sectarian efforts are marginalized. They don't disappear. There's still people hanging around the periphery. Uh, and maybe if, if, if the motive and commitment declines, they may begin to take over, as we're beginning to see in Egypt. But uh, I don't have any other way to do it. Next question is from um, Paul Laverty, close associate to Ken Loach and also award-winning screenwriter. There has probably never been a time where there has been such concentration of wealth and power in so few hands. The powerful are sophisticated in maintaining the state of affairs, but perhaps we use this too as an excuse to hide our shortcomings on the left. What do you think has been lacking in our imaginative effort to build a mass international campaign to democratize resources and challenge corporate power? Can you imagine a time where we can organize our lives and economies successfully on a cooperative basis instead than a competitive one? Certainly can imagine it. And in fact, there, there have been successful experiments with it, uh, some of them right now. Uh, none of them are utopia. None of them are what I or you or others would aspire to, but they're not insignificant. I like to say the Mondragon system in Spain. It's, it's not worker managed, but it's worker owned. It's a form of cooperative, quite successful, uh, very broad, lots of problems, but uh, quite real. Uh, if you look around the United States, there, there are probably hundreds of uh, uh, self-managed uh, 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 enterprises, you know, not huge. Some of them are pretty large, but huge, they're successful. Uh, take, say, uh, Egypt right now. Uh, one of the interesting things that's happening in Egypt is that the labor movement, which has been very militant for years, as I mentioned, this is not an uprising out of nothing. Uh, they've now apparently, it's hard to get information because it's not covered very well, but actually I think Amir Haas has been reporting this, that uh, in uh, the, some of the industrial centers, like again the Mahala, uh, big industrial center, Apparently, workers have taken over the, uh, 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 the enterprises and are managing them themselves. Well, if that's true, that would be the, be the beginning of a revolution. Uh, go back to John Berger's words. Uh, so yes, it's, it's certainly feasible. What's been lacking, the, the comment about the inequality is very real. I don't know the detailed statistics for other countries, but in the United States, where I know it, it's, uh, inequality is back to the highest level it's ever been in history, the 1920s. But that's misleading because the inequality in the United States is highly concentrated. It's mostly in the top fraction of 1% of the population. You take a look at the, uh, uh, the income distribution, it goes very sharply up towards the high end and literally one-tenth of 1% 1 of the population now has extraordinary wealth. In fact, that's driving the inequality. If you take that part away, it's unequal, but not totally out of sight. Who are they? Are they hedge fund managers, uh, CEOs, uh, bankers, and so on? Well, uh, something quite significant has been happening. Uh, since the 1970s, uh, the economy has changed significantly. It's been financialized. Um, go back to, say, 1970, uh, financial institutions, you know, banks, investment firms, were a small percentage of corporate profits. And at the, now, in 2007, they reached 40%. Uh, the, uh, they, don't, they don't benefit the economy. In fact, they probably harm the economy. There's no central social utility to them, but they're powerful. And they, uh, with economic power, it comes political power, uh, pre uh, pretty obvious reasons. So they have gained extensive political power. For example, it's financial institutions that put Obama into office pretty much. That's where most of his funding came from. Uh, with political power comes the opportunity to modify the legal, the legislative system, and they've been doing it. So f since the 1970s, late 1980s mainly, 
uh, fiscal policies have been changed, say tax policies, to ensure rapid concentration, very high concentration of wealth. Uh, rules of corporate governance have been changed. Uh, they allow, for example, the CEO of a corporation to select the board that determines his salary. Well, you can imagine what the consequences of that are. Actually, you read them in the front pages of the newspapers every day about the huge bonuses being given to management. That's where that comes from. Uh, the uh, uh, regulation has been has collapsed with very striking effects. Uh, New Deal regulation. Instantly, this generalizes to the rest of the world. I'm talking about the United States because I know it better. Uh, uh, New Deal regulation uh, prevented any financial crises up until the 1980s, really. In the 1970s, it started to be dismantled. Uh, since the 1980s, crisis after crisis, several during the Reagan years, pretty serious ones. In fact, Reagan left office with the worst financial crisis since the Depression, the savings and loan, uh, then came Clinton and the tech crisis, then this, finally this housing crisis, uh, $8 trillion of fake money disappeared, uh, devastating the economy. Well, all of these are, legal, are, are political decisions. And meanwhile, the cost of campaigning went way up. Uh, and that compels the parties to climb pretty deep into the pockets of the corporate sector. That's where the money is. Uh, the next election, 2012, is expected to uh, cost about $2 billion. Uh, and you take a look at uh, the Obama administration, you notice he's staffing uh, the government right now with executives. You know, they're the ones who have the access to the corporate funding that's going to buy the election. Uh, uh, elections are just becoming farces, you know, run by public relations industry. They're marketing efforts, and they kind of say it openly. But in fact, Obama won the award from the advertising industry for the best marketing campaign of 2008. Uh, they know exactly what's going on. Uh, well, you know, all of this is a kind of a vicious cycle. Increased concentration of wealth, increased political power. It acts to further increase wealth. Why is there no reaction? Actually, there is a reaction right now for the first time. Uh, what's going on in Wisconsin is a very significant reaction. Uh, there are tens of thousands of people in the streets day after day uh, with a lot of popular support. Uh, maybe two-thirds of the population supporting them. They're trying to defend labor rights, the right of collective bargaining, which is under attack. I mean, the, the business world understands very well that the one barrier to this total corporate tyranny is the organized workers' movement. So that's got to be destroyed. Uh, very uh, 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 Labor history in the United States has been extremely violent, more so than in Europe. And there's been effort after effort to wipe out the unions. They keep reviving. Uh, now is a major one going on, but it's being resisted. It's being resisted by large popular movements. Well, where's the left? Actually, what's happened to the left is interesting. It, 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 since the 1960s, when there was a big revival, uh, there is a, quite an activist left. Uh, there are more young activists now than there were in the 60s. But the issues have changed. The issues are what are sometimes called post-materialist. They're important issues. Don't denigrate them. So gay rights, environmental rights, women's rights, you know, they're all really important things. But they don't reach to the concerns of the people who are living under depression-level unemployment. They don't reach to the 20% of the population, roughly, who need food stamps. Uh, there hasn't been that kind of outreach and organizing. So when the protest started in Wisconsin a couple of weeks ago, there, there was practically no left initiative. I mean, a couple of well-known figures came in to give talks, but uh, it was not organized by the left groups who ought to be right at the heart of it. Uh, it's, uh, it's there, and it, it'll, it better come or else we're in bad trouble. But uh, uh, while left activism is significant, uh, very significant, it's pretty much divorced from the daily struggles for survival and the decent life of most of the population.
And that's a gap that has to be overcome somehow. Last question is from um, Alice Walker, award-winning author. I believe that a one-state solution to the Palestine-Israel impasse is inevitable, and more than just a two-state solution could ever be. This is because I don't believe Israel will ever give up trying to control Palestinians, whether citizens of Israel or those living in the occupied territories. Under a two-state solution, there would be Israel and a Palestinian Bantustan. I have been struck by your dismissal of the one-state idea as something the most absurd and would like to understand why you see it this way. Is there no hope that Israelis and Palestinians might live together as white and black people do after the fall of apartheid in South Africa? It's an interesting question. She's a very, uh, she's a wonderful woman, does fine work. She's really committed to the Palestinian cause. But the question tells you something about the recent Palestine solidarity movement. I mean, if I had asked her, let's say, why do you think it's absurd to uh, try to advocate for civil rights for blacks in the United States, she'd be nonplussed. She's devoted a lot of her life to that. In fact, the only possible response would be, you know, what planet are you coming from? That's what I've been doing all my life. That's exactly the same here. It's now about 70 years uh, that I've been advocating for what in the recent reincarnation is called a one-state settlement. Uh, a one-state settlement notice, not solution. A one-state settlement uh, used to be called a binational settlement. And if you think about it, yes, it'll have to be binational settlement. So that's what I was when I was a young activist in the 1940s, opposed to a Jewish state. Uh, that was what we were struggling for, a binational state, a one-state settlement. Uh, and that's continued without a break. And it's kind of hard to miss. Uh, since uh, the late the 1960s, uh, a series of books, a uh, huge number of articles, uh, constant talks all the time, uh, thousands of them, uh, interviews, all the same, uh, trying to work for a, a binational settlement, opposition to a Jewish state. Done a ton of work on this, activist work, uh, writing, and so on. Uh, but it's it, it's not a, just a slogan, and I think that's why somebody like Alice Walker doesn't know it. It's not just a slogan, let's all live together happily. It's trying to look at the problem seriously. If you're serious about it, you ask, how do we get there? You ask, what are the steps that will take us there? Not just, wouldn't it be nice if we had peace? You know, that's easy. How do we get there? Well, you know, that depends on circumstances, like all tactical choices. So in the pre-1948 period, it was straightforward. It said, we don't want a Jewish state. Let's have a binational state. Uh, 48 to 67, you couldn't sensibly take that position. You're talking to yourself. In 1967, it opened up again. There, were, there was an opportunity in 67 to move towards some kind of a federal system, which could then proceed further to closer integration, maybe become a true binational and secular state. And in fact, at that time, 67 on, I was uh, writing about it all over the place. Like I said, books, articles, interviews, and so on. Uh, up till about 1975. 1975, Palestinian nationalism crystallized and appeared on the agenda. And the PLO uh, turned to a two-state settlement, the huge overwhelming international consensus by that time for two-state settlement in the form that everyone knows. 67 to 75, it was possible to advocate for it directly, and it was anathema, hated, you know, denounced, because it was threatening. It was threatening because it could be fulfilled, and that would harm policy formation. So, you know, if, you were, if it was noticed at all, it was denounced and vilified. 75 on, you can still maintain the position, but you have to face reality. It's going to have to be achieved in stages. And there's only one proposal that I've ever heard, other than, yeah, let's all live in peace together. Uh, the one proposal that I know is, if I'm glad to listen if there's another one, is begin with the international consensus, two-state settlement. Uh, it would reduce the level of violence, the cycle of violence, it would open up possibilities for a closer interaction, which already to some extent takes place, even in today's circumstances. 
uh, commercial, cultural, other forms of interaction, uh, that could lead to erosion of boundaries. It could move on to closer integration and uh, maybe something like the old concept of a binational state. Now, I call that a settlement because I don't think that's the end of the road. I don't see any particular reason to worship imperialist boundaries. Uh, so, like when I was, uh, my wife and I, back when we were students, were backpacking up in northern uh, Israel and happened to cross into Lebanon because there's no marked border. You know, somebody finally yelled at us and said, you better get back. But why should there be a border there? It was imposed by uh, British and French violence. Uh, you should move towards a closer integration of the whole region. Uh, no state settlement, if you want the word. And there's plenty wrong with states anyway. Uh, why should we worship state structures? They should be eroded. So it's a step. It's a series of steps. Now, if anyone can think of another way to get there, then they ought to tell us. We could listen to it and talk about it. But I don't know of any other way. So what you end up with, at least I end up with, what I've been writing and speaking about, is something that's too complex to put on a Twitter message. And uh, in this age, that means it doesn't exist. You have to support both a two-state and a one-state solution, set, settlement, not solution. You support both of them because one of them is the path to getting to the other. If you don't make the first move, you're not going to get anywhere. Now, uh, Alice Walker says uh, Israel wouldn't, won't accept a two-state uh, settlement. Yeah, she's right. Uh, it, uh, a fortiori is not going to accept a one-state settlement. So if that argument has any force, uh, her proposal is out the window, mine too. Uh, uh, and the same, by the same argument, you could show there could never be an end to apartheid. Uh, white nationalists would never accept an end to apartheid, which was true. Okay, therefore, let's give up the anti-apartheid struggle. Uh, uh, Indonesia would never give up East Timor. In fact, the generals said so loudly. It's our province. We're going to keep it. And that, that would have been true if actions were taken in a vacuum. But they're not taken in a vacuum. There are other factors involved. And one factor, which is significant and in fact, in these cases, decisive, is U.S. policy. Well, that's not graven in stone. When U.S. policy shifted on uh, Indonesia and East Timor, it literally took one phrase from President Clinton to get the Indonesian generals out. At one point, he said, it's over. They withdrew. Uh, in the case of apartheid, it's a little more complicated. Uh, Cuba played a big role. Uh, Cuba drove... South Africans out of Namibia, for example, and pr protected Angola and so on. That had a big impact. But it was when the U.S. changed policy around 1990, uh, there was a change of policy. It was at that point that apartheid collapsed. Now, in the case of Israel, it's just the U.S. is decisive. I mean, Israel can't do anything except what the U.S. Uh, supports. It has to, it gives uh, diplomatic, military, economic, uh, ideological support. If that prop is pulled out, they do what the U.S. says. In fact, that's happened over and over. So yes, it's true that if they were acting in a vacuum, they'd never accept uh, anything but what they're now doing, you know, taking over you know, Gaza prison, uh, take over as much of the occupied territory as you want. Yeah, they'll continue. Uh, but they're not acting in a vacuum. There are things we can do, as in other cases, to change it. And in that case, I think you can uh, uh, consider and even lay out a plan for uh, a move towards a one-state settlement as a step towards something even better, uh, which can can go on. You know, uh, but I, if, as far as I can see, the only way to do that is by supporting the international consensus as a first step, uh, a step to be a prelude to further steps, and that means very concrete actions. Uh, we don't have to talk about. Uh, we don't have to have a seminar in which we discuss uh, you know, abstract possibilities. There are very concrete moves that can be made. So for example, withdrawal of the IDF, the Israeli army, from the West Bank. Well, that's a concrete proposal. And there are steps that can be taken to implement it. For example, uh, Amnesty International, which is hardly a revolutionary organization, uh, called for an arms embargo on Israel. Well, if the United States and Britain France, others could be uh, 
if the public could compel the governments to accept the, that proposal as an arms embargo, unless you pull your army out of the West Bank, that would have an effect. Uh, other actions can too. If the army's pulled out of the West Bank, the settlers are going to go with them. Now uh, they'll climb into the lorries provided to them and move from their subsidized homes in the West Bank to subsidized homes in Israel, They're just like they did in Gaza when they got the order. Uh, some will probably remain, but that's okay. They want to remain in a Palestinian state. That's their business. Uh, so there, there, there are quite concrete things that can be done. It's not going to be like uh, you know, snapping your fingers, but uh, not, not beyond the kinds of things that have happened elsewhere when policy of the great powers changed, primarily the U.S. Professor Chomsky, thank you very much.